Abby being the Hamilton Interfaith Peace Group. Any group, uh, the, the two people heading it are a Baha'i professor at McMaster University and a Presbyterian. I don't think he's a minister, I think he's just a devout follower of his Presbyterian church. And uh, anyway, I'm on their steering committee or whatever we call it. And I'm also going to be one of the presenters at storytelling. Uh, and so the idea was to find stories that relate to nature or the environment or the importance of caring for our environment, at least being aware of. Yeah. of the world around us in our spiritual practice. And so this story was told about, this story is actually not about, it wasn't told as a lesson in the importance of nature it just happens to be one that dove, dovetails nicely with the environment and it's sort of exemplary of the buddhist view of of nature buddhism isn't i mean the, the Bud, early buddhist texts aren't openly uh, protective of nature uh, as as in consciously being concerned about its protection closest you get there are things like the Buddha saying it's hard to find uh, for uh, monks not being allowed to cut, to harm uh, wild, uh, plant life. But none of that's really conclusive. Probably the best, the closest you could get to the idea of protecting nature would be uh, the importance of living in the forest and the appreciation. I say there's certainly an appreciation of nature throughout the Buddhist, the early Buddhist texts. But uh, a couple of things is first of all, of course, in 2,500 years ago, there wasn't the concern over the environment, not to the same level as we have it today. But second of all, Buddhism hits a much more core issue with its focus on greed and the stressing of contentment to the, to, to the point that um, anyone following these Buddhist teachings shouldn't have to be concerned about the environment because they've already um, dedicated themselves or directed themselves in such a way as to be protective of the environment or protective at least in the sense of non-destruct, non-harmful living a life that um, conserves or preserves the environment this is actually a story about contentment which I think is one of the key issues that uh, are being neglected uh, as far as those that impact the environment. And I bring up greed as well, greed and, and, and its opposite of contentment, and I would single those out as really the two key killers in the environment. I mean, it's nice to want to recycle and want to uh, Be conscious of our choices, but inevitably we, we can't have our cake and eat it too. You can't destroy the you can't you know, not destroy you can't get everything you want or you can't pursue this incessant and obsessive path of desiring more and more, consuming more and more, and expect to conserve the beauty and the nature 
and the peace and the harmony of, of the world. In the end, all we'll have left, no offense, but all we'll have left is places like this. Um, no matter how beautiful this, the Buddha center might be, no replacement for the net. Anyway, so on with the story. It's the Maha Sukha Jataka, number 429. And so the story goes that there was this monk living in a forest near a border village in the Kosala country. And he had, he had learned how to meditate from the Buddha and then gone off on his own to live. And the place that he lived, he was able to get pretty much anything he wanted. He lived in a place where there were a lot of um, people and a lot of religious people. So they would support him with alms, whether they were Buddhist or not. It wasn't a thing at that, in, in that time in India. People just supported religious people. So they would give him food and probably give him quite luxurious um, gifts and, and support. You know, so not only was he well taken care of, he was probably over, he was probably pampered. And this was this has always been common in religious circles. And when you go to a place where there's a high volume of people, it's pretty easy to live and to actually become somewhat indulgent and live in opulence, even as a as an ascetic. Hence the need for all the rules. So there were all these rules that monks had to keep and well, to some extent, that helps me. At any rate, he seems to have gotten a little bit spoiled by it. Um, and having though having said that, he was... Well, what happened is the, the village burnt down. The whole town around him burnt down, fields and houses and everything. And everybody was suddenly reduced to poverty. And suddenly he was not so well taken care of. And so to be fair to him, he was put in a position that you know, wasn't just about living with little. It was perhaps living with some great hardship. That being said, um, that, that really is par for the course, or it's part of the package that you're signing up for when you become a Buddhist monk. I mean... I've been there, not having food or having very little food. It's, it's actually quite liberating to just let go and be at peace with that. But he couldn't do that. So he was quite upset and his meditation suffered. And so the Buddha came to him and said, or the, no, he came to the, he went to the Buddha after the rains and he said, look, I can't stay there. This is really too tough. And, he said, it's, it's really, or he didn't, so he just said, you know, this is really, this is the problem. And the Buddha said, well, in that case, be content with whatever you have. Live off of whatever you, whatever people give you. Be content with that, because that's the way of the ancients. That's the way in the olden days. Uh, people practiced religious life. And he said, even animals... Even animals are able to be content when they live in a place that is suitable for their lives. They don't worry about you know, their they don't they don't go flying off looking for a better place. They repent and they live through hardship. Even animals are able to do that. Why would you be so quick to fly away and find a new place? It's a, it's quite a, it's, it's it's maybe a little bit surprising to people who think, wow, the Buddha really expects a lot. But you have to understand you know, what is the core of the Buddha's message. It's about rising above, really, rising above samsara. I mean, preconceptions we have that it must be like this. And, Preconceptions of health, for example, that if you if you don't eat enough, you're undernourished, and so on. Preconceptions about so many things. 
You know, like we take vitamins and we try to eat all this good food, concerned about it, saying, you know, I have to stay in good health. But what really does that mean? Health mean being able to stay alive, or does it mean being virile? Virile, right? Virile. Potent, right? A lot of health has to do with being able to exercise and have sex and uh, play sports and games and fight. You know, a lot of it is to kill. To kill. You know, this is the, the old uh, instincts that we have. In fact, if you just talk about being alive and furthermore keeping your mind from giving into obsession, you really don't need a lot. In fact, you're much better when you're being tested, when you're forced to all sorts of circumstances. So anyway, in order to drive this home, he, he told, tells a story. And I think it's a cute story. Maybe it's kind of a silly story. but Once upon a time, myriads of parrots lived in the Himalaya countries on the banks of the Ganges in a grove of fig trees. A king of the parrots there, when the fruit of the tree in which he dwelt had come to an end, ate whatever was left, whether shoot or leaf or bark or rind, and drank of water from the Ganges, and being very happy and contented, he kept where he was. Owing to his happy and contented state, the abode of Saka was shaken. Saka, reflecting on the cause, saw the parrot, and to test his virtue by his supernatural power, he withered up the tree, which became a mere stump, perforated with holes, and stood to be buffeted by every blast of wind, and from the holes dust came up. The parrot king ate this dust and drank the water of the Ganges, and going nowhere else, perched on the top of the fig stump, reckoning not of wind and sun. Saka noticed how very contented the parrot was, and said, After hearing him speak of the virtue of friendship, I will come and give him his choice of a boon, and cause the fig tree to bear ambrosial fruit. So he took the form of a royal goose, and preceded by Sujja, in the shape of an Asura nymph, he went to the grove of fig trees, and perching on the bough of a tree close by, he entered into a conversation with the parrot, and spoke the first stanza. Wherever fruitful trees abound, a flock of hungry birds is found. But should the trees all withered be, away at once the birds will flee. And after these words, to drive the parrot thence, he spoke the second stanza. Is thee, Sir Redbeak, to be gone? Why dost thou sit and dream alone? Come tell me, prithee, bird of spring, to this dead stump, why dost thou cling? And the parrot said, O oh, goose, from a feeling of gratitude I forsake not this tree. And he repeated two stanzas. They who have been close friends from youth, mindful of goodness and of truth, in life and death, in weal and woe, the claims of friendship ne'er forego. I too would fain be kind and good to the to one that long my friend has stood. I wish to live, but have no heart from this old tree, though dead, to part. Daka, on hearing what he said, was delighted and praising him, wished to offer him a choice and uttered two stanzas. I know thy friendship and thy grateful love, virtues the, that wise men surely must approve. I offer thee whatever thou wilt for choice. Parrot, what boon would most thy heart rejoice? On hearing this, the parrot, making his choice, spoke the seventh stanza. If thou, O goose, what most I crave wouldst give, grant that the tree I love again may live. Let it once more with its old vigor shoot, gather fresh sweetness, and bear goodly fruit. Then Saka, granting the boon, spoke the eighth stanza. Lo, friend, a fruitful and right noble tree, well fitted for thy dwelling place to be. Let it once more with its old vigor shoot, gather, gather fresh sweetness, and bear goodly fruit. With these words, Saka quitted his present form and manifesting the supernatural power of himself and Suja. He took up water from the Ganges in his hand and dashed it against the fig tree stump. 
Straightway the tree rose up, rich in branch and stem, and with honey-sweet fruit, and stood a charming sight like unto the bare jewel mount. The parrot king, on seeing it, was highly pleased, and singing the praises of Saka, he spoke the ninth stanza. May Saka and all loved by Saka blessed be, as I today am blessed by, bless this goodly sight to see. Saka, after granting the parrot his choice and causing the fig tree to bear ambrosial fruit, returned with Sujata to his own abode. In illustration of this story, these stanzas inspired by perfect wisdom were added at the close. So this is the Buddha himself. Soon as King Parrot wisely made his choice, the tree once more put forth its fruit again. Then Saka with his king did fly amain to where in Nandana the gods rejoice. It's not so important stanza. So the importance, so that's the story. The, the importance of it is in regards to the contentment and also in regards to the the loyalty. There's another uh, story in here, I think, about, or there's somewhere a simile of, of a, a tree branch. You don't cut down a tree if you've, if you've, uh, if you've ever gotten shade from the tree. There's several simile, similes about this sort of thing. Well, I mean, this kind of has, I mean, you could certainly, and I probably will at this forum, forum. talk about how talk about how Robin, if you're echoing you're echoing Talk about how it relates to the environment. So that the environment is is something we should be aware of. That it has supported us. And I'm not sure how much you want to anthropomorphize nature in terms of saying we have to be thankful to the trees and faithful and loyal to them. I'm not really convinced by that argument, but it's the good it's a good sort of attitude to take that things that help you. It's important to recognize their value. Like Joni Mitchell said, don't we, don't always seem to go that you don't know what you've got till it's gone. So as we, as the species, begin to pave paradise, this sort of thing that that we should be uh, giving giving th thought to and, and contemplating. on how we're treating the environment, how we're treating the tree under which we find shade, the tree under which we have found shade. And so on the one hand, on the one hand, as Buddhists, we recognize the importance of not clinging, you know, not clinging to the past. But it's, it's, it's easy, and it does happen in Buddhist societies, for this to translate in not caring about those things that are important. In Buddhist countries, tend to, they tend to have a fairly poor record of the, envi of the environment. I, mean, I don't know if that's fair. I think Sri Lanka has done okay. And I suppose some of the Mahayana countries have done okay. I know Thailand's done fairly poorly. Burma as well. I don't know if you could... Do, you could uh, connect that with Buddhism at all, but I do know Buddhists can be somewhat callous about the environment. Callous about uh, nature. As they think, you know, just let it go. It's, don't cling. Don't hold on. It's just really basic. What, what, they, what, what they're really doing is not being aware. And we don't want to obsess or, or be too fixated on 
anything. I think as this, what this story really does show is that has support us and only it only hurts us if we neglect it. That which is important, nature being one of those things. Anyway, so just want to that's all I had to say. No. Anyone has questions, I'm happy to answer them. If you have a question. In, if you're interested in some of the things I do, you can look up my... If anyone has a question, please type a one uh, so that not everyone speak at once. Thank you, Bunte. That's a really wonderful story. Go ahead and talk if anyone wants to turn on voice. Go ahead. Please go ahead, Taylor. Mm, I just want to thank you deeply for sharing that story. I, um, I like to consider myself as one who is committed to the tree and faithful to the tree, even when it becomes poorly. And um, I just, I felt very touched by that part of the story and I thank you for sharing that and it's just beautiful so thank you Good, I'm glad. Well, you guys are sort of my guinea pig because uh, you guys are my test subject read it once and I wanted to familiar with it when the time comes to read it. Yeah, I don't like talking about guinea pigs or lab rats because we've just been talking about the environment and it's not really something you should be I don't know, I feel I feel well, I think there's I'm I'm safe in saying that as Buddhists that's one of the horrible things that humanity has thought. Do we protect the tree? Well, I don't know that Buddhism is so much about protecting the tree. As I said, Buddhism is much more about changing people's hearts. Because the re you know cutting down one tree isn't such a big deal, but our mass slaughter of the environment it, it comes from something different. It comes from greed. It comes from consumerism and this this inset passion, passionate and drive for sensual pleasure and and, and materialism and. and but yeah, if we practice, if we practice spirituality and love and compassion, and I mean, contentment really, contentment I think is something that is 
underrepresented in spirituality. So spiritual people can at times be somewhat indulgent themselves. You know, um, it's not across, across the board, but it is possible because there's there can be the indulgence of of one's desires and so on, which can lead to excess. But contentment contentment is is key. You know, there's the three R's: reduce, reuse, recycle. I've been I've been an environmentalist since, gosh, I don't know how long. My parents were in the anti-nuke um, movement, trying to stop them from burying nuclear waste in our backyard in northern Ontario, and stop them from opening a nuclear power plant in northern Ontario, that kind of thing. And uh, so I learned about all these things. I was the head of the environmental committee at school. And, uh, but, but what's interesting is the three R's, reduce, reuse, re recycle. Um, my stepmother once pointed out to me really something that stuck with me for a long time. And as a Buddhist, it, it resonates a lot. They're in an order for a reason. You know, what's the one that we focus on the most? Recycle. Recycle is the last one. And it's the last one for a reason. It's not the best one. It's the worst of the three. It's the least useful of the three. Reduce. Reduce beats everything. If you reduce, you know, recycling is a bit of a, it can be a bit of a sham, a bit of a, a scam. Well, not a scam, but I don't know. I mean, I don't know exactly the figures, and I know recycling is good, but it's one of those things that can be at times a feel good. I was... I was doing recycling in high school, and we had to look into all this, and it was a real, you know, it was nice to be able to say we were doing it, but it's a lot of work, and a lot of work goes into re recycling, right? A lot of energy goes into it. Anyway, it's a good thing, especially with things like cardboard and so on, but reduce feeds it, you know, that order of magnitude, and then reuse. Reuse as well is... is not as good because you're still consuming because you still have to consume the first time but when you reuse you don't use it the second time you don't need, you need the same but but that's interesting from a buddhist point of view because that that's kind of points to our that that's points to what i was saying is it's not about these proactive things like recycling it's like don't use in the first place you know don't go that way in the first place it's not our it's not, it, the environment isn't a mess because we're not recycling. That's not the case. It's a mess because we're using in the first place. We're overusing. And that comes from greed. That comes from all the things that Buddhism, Buddhism is talking about. The Buddhism and the environment. Not something I normally talk about, but uh, I've been asked to give, give this, tell this story. So. I've only got 12 minutes to tell it. It took me, I think, five to tell the actual story, so I'll have some extra. I realized it was only going to take five minutes, so it be seven minutes. There's another interesting story in Buddhism about how uh, the earth describes the degradation of the earth uh, in 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 sync with our degradation as 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 beings so it, it points to this trend that started when we were angels or, or celestial beings floating around the earth and as we consumed of the earth uh, our bodies became coarser and the earth itself became coarser and it's just gotten more and more coarse and and we're fine apparently which I guess makes sense. I mean, the human body is probably one of the ugliest. Well, maybe. I don't know about that, actually. But if you look at animal bodies, they're much more elegant, right? The human body, I mean, what are we? We go bald. <laughs> like, I'm going bald. They're coming out of everywhere for no good reason. Normally, we would say that humans are higher than animals, but... I mean, we're higher in terms of intelligence, mindfulness, that kind of thing. But 
you know, before with, with survival of the fittest, there was an elegance to it. It's a horrible, horrific, evil elegance in a sense. Thankfully, we're not doing that. But so, I don't know. It's, that's quite complicated. That's an interesting topic. We don't, absolutely, we don't want to be uh, back to survival of the fittest. But there's got to be something in there about um, at least you can say the contentment with our. Um, Grossness. Okay with. Like, I think you could even, and this is controversial, people, some people may not want to hear this, but, you know, if you've got, if you're born with something, some condition, to accept that that is some karmic result and work to improve in the future. It's kind of a thing that we're doing less now. So we're more about um, being okay with and I hope I hope I don't sound that doesn't sound awful, but I think there's something in there. Obviously, we should never treat people as less than right? a person who is born with a disability or whatever, or who acquires a disability or however, should not be treated as lesser and should not be looked down. And there is a danger of that. Some Buddhists actually tend to look down on those who have suffering. But that's not, um, that's, that's, that's a horrible misunderstanding of, of the Buddhist way. What we look down upon, what we shun, is evil. And so we recognize that evil may have caused certain imperfections in us, you know, certain um, causes of suffering. Right? It's not causing the suffering, that's one thing. And so we do our best to try and mitigate that. But if it is causing you suffering, understand that it's a cause. That being said, a person can have a infection or whatever, and still of, of the body, and still be perfect in the mind. Clear in the mind. Don't please don't take any of that the wrong way. Puritanical thinking is dangerous. No, but I think there's something to accepting our accepting the consequences of our deeds. Whereas we don't want to look down on others. If 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 I have, you know, if there's something wrong with me, I mean, I, I I don't I don't feel un in in uh, disinclined to accept and say, well, yeah. Do that with Buddhists do that with a lot of things. I don't know, I was just trying to tie it in that it's it, it. I mean the, the general point is that our karma these days is definitely more core. Getting very much obsessed with instant gratification. And that has a result. That has consequences, as we can see in the world around us. The world around us is less beautiful than it was a thousand years ago. Island of plastic, and, you know, the size of Texas. You could argue that that's just, you know, it's just still just not nature. But I don't think it's arguable that that's as refined the world is not as harmonious as it was. And I don't mean in terms of war or anything, I just mean the nature. More complicated, more coarse. The pollution in the big cities, take that. So I was just trying to tie it into our, our inner selves as well. Our bodies are probably...
Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't exactly agree. I mean, to me, compassion is the most important. Wisdom is more important to me than compassion. But there are different schools of Buddhism have different thoughts. To me, it's about understanding. High school, we focus very much on wisdom. Is anyone? No, compassion, absolutely, but uh, just I guess I just add that wisdom. What important is to have wisdom about things. A misunderstanding. Thank you all. It's been uh, live. Good people. One. Practitioners, followers, people interested in the Buddha's teaching. Sadhu Bhante, thank you. Wonderful talk.